There is mounting global pressure on the World Health Organization to answer to critics who say it was too slow in its response to the coronavirus from when it was first detected, and too trusting of the data it got from China where the outbreak started. Severely mismanaging and covering up the spread. Its credibility questioned. We've got uh, serious concerns about the accuracy of the information coming out. Even its role challenged, but the organization which compiles and shares data from 190 member states around the world is also seen as valuable. Canada will always be there to support uh, science and the work done internationally. Including by Dr. Theresa Tam, Canada's top doctor, who sits on the committee that oversees the WHO Health Emergencies Program and uses much of that scientific evidence to chart the way forward for Canada. There are uh, questions being raised about the way the WHO has handled this, the way they've dealt with China, the fact that they um, took the information from China at face value. Do you think that those are fair criticisms? Um, I think it's a, it's a very difficult job to do but honestly, I think the data is what it is. You're going to have to work with information at the time that you've received, and it may be incomplete. No, but should they have su assumed that um, because they were dealing with a country that isn't transparent, that the information they were getting wasn't accurate, that the problem was probably worse than China was letting on? Um, I think we have to remain open to different scenarios. Um, the international community of the top experts in this area of work um, also maybe if, um, because of the evolution of the knowledge may have all underestimated where this could have gone. The estimations of how transmissible the virus was um, and how severe it was, was unclear at the start. The loss of containment, really, mm -hmm. uh, with the spread to other countries outside of Asia and outside of China, I think was something that uh, people underestimated globally. Do you not think that the WHO, and I know you play a role in the WHO, that, that we would need some sort of post-mortem um, in terms of how they, how they did things early on? I think it's always worthwhile uh, to examine what went on, especially after such an extraordinary and sure. unprecedented event. We would always want that and look at what could be done better. Like all warnings, maybe not every country took it as seriously as they could. But in Canada, we stood up our response really, really early and started getting the country prepared. But absolutely, I think you know, a re-examination of what went well, what didn't go well. Um, in the end, though, I think the spirit of the IHR is that every country has to share information. So it's not just up to the WHO, it's all member states actually have to do what we said we were going to do. Right. And so, um, so there'll be um, lessons learned for both sides. You have uh, been attacked by the Alberta Premier, Jason Kenney. This is the same Dr. Tam who in January was repeating uh, talking points um, out of the PRC about uh, no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. The Conservative leadership candidate Derek Sloan asked the question, does she work for Canada or for China? How do you feel when you hear those kinds of comments? Um, well, I mean, first of all, I know that that is false information. Uh, but, you know, as I've said, I'm really busy focusing on the actual response and that is what I'm here to do. And, and I don't do this alone. It is a collective response. So, um, so that is a really important point. I mean, uh, this started early on in the kinds of uh, attacks you get on social media. Um, much of it racist, uh, some of it misogynist. Um, I would like to know how you experience that, or do you? Yes, and I think maybe I just sort of compartmentalize it, I don't know. I think everybody copes with these things a little bit differently. One of the things I worry most is stigmatization mm -hmm. of certain populations, and I spoke out on that. Um, knowing how we treat people um, in different ways affects people's health, and that's how I sort of look at it, mm -hmm. and stigmatization is leads to poor health outcomes and it does not help 
uh, our collective response. So I think the only way to get through this is to do it together. And one of my roles as the Chief Public Health Officer is to speak to Canadians and bring them along. That's what I worry about more than any individual attack on me personally, is that I am the credible voice. And in order to maintain that credibility, in order to uh, provide the kind of messaging that would bring Canadians along so that they know what the advice is. So I think that um, is what I'm trying to preserve. There are now 49,025 confirmed cases, including 2,766 deaths. When you give your briefing each morning, you start always the same way, uh, the number of cases, the number of deaths, those are people that we're talking about. And I wonder Absolutely. what that's like for you to have to say that every day. It is actually very difficult. And I think behind the sort of calm sort of reporting to give people the actual facts is, you know, in our brains and I think in our hearts is that we're moving along with the emotions of the population. We feel extremely impacted when we hear about and look at the long-term care home outbreaks and knowing that every number that I utter is someone's family member. Um, in the way that I've always worked is I imagine that the person or the Canadian sitting in the middle of everything that I do. I think that what is difficult is that this pandemic has of course shone a light on the health inequities. Yeah. But it is a societal challenge. It's not a single person. It is um, how we uh, value and support our elders and our seniors. And I think all of us needs to re-examine um, what we need to do going forwards. You, you talked about your, your cautious optimism. Can you right now give people a sense of how long they have to dig in this way? How long should people be expected to feel this far apart, so far apart from people? So I think the reason why we have some optimism is that we are seeing this epidemic slowing down. But until you have actual immunity in the population, we know that people's lifestyles will have to be adjusted. I think public health is asking, well, here are some of the parameters. Come up with a plan of how your workplace could potentially be um, redesigned, have your shift a bit differently. Mm -hmm. You stagger people coming in so that you're not just your work shifts, but maybe your public transport means that you're not all crowded at the same rush hour. Right, right. Those are the kind of ideas that will allow, I think, um, some of those measures to be uh, eased off a bit. But I think my concern right now is that the cost of reignition of the epidemic is, is, is huge. I just have the image of New York City in my head and I think I would never want that to happen anywhere in Canada and if we let um, things resume too fast, we may get that kind of surge. I think we need to plan, in any case, for all of that surge to still be in place. I'm still planning ahead to well, what happens in the next winter um, season when um, it's not just living with uh, COVID-19, you're gonna get influenza, you're gonna get the other viruses. And so being able to uh, prepare for that is part of the new normal as well. How hard is that to know that people are sort of getting to the end of what they can handle emotionally and mentally? All of us feel a little bit fraught at this point, yes. I think, right? Yes, yeah, so I do think that this sort of juncture is a particularly difficult one where mm -hmm. people have contributed so much already and you're trying to say, it's a bit like running the marathon and sort of hitting a bit that wall and you go, there's still another 10 kilometers <laughs> before we're kind of here. Uh, it, is, it is tough. I think looking at blocks of time is important. So you can't look too far ahead. Let's look at the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. Last two weeks, I'm thinking, okay, there are signs that this, this curve is bending. 
you're now seeing some jurisdictions being able to get to that next phase soon. And so I think we are seeing those little steps and little bits of progress, I think, is what gets people going. I, I don't, are you a worrier? I don't know if you're a worrier. You said the other day you're working about 20 hours a day. Do you, do you lie in bed and, and get stressed out? What do you do to help yourself? I know um, you don't like talking about yourself, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm a fairly private person and yeah. a bit of an introvert, but um, it's true, I do feel a bit tired. Uh, but I am fully cognizant of the fact that when I advise our team to make sure you, know, you keep your mental health up and, and your physical health as well, that I might not be the best example and that I need to do better on that mm -hmm. front. Thank you very much for all this time. I appreciate Thank it you. very much. And I would shake your hand, but I'm not allowed to. That's right. <laughs> You'd so. be very mad at me. Yes. <laughs> so, Rosie, you, you got a lot of information from Dr. Tam, and, and you pressed her on some of her advice to government. What's your big takeaway? Well, first of all, I think just the speed at which all of this has unfolded, the pandemic and, and the many, many unknowns and the way in which the public health agency and Dr. Tam have had to adapt and evolve their advice over time, leading to some really unprecedented government decisions, stopping cruise ships, shutting down international travel, shutting down the Canada-U.S. border. Much of this was pretty much unimaginable just six weeks ago. And when you ultimately think back to the interview, was there something that you were hoping to get out of it? You know, the chief public health officer is really there to offer her best scientific advice. It is the government who makes the decision. So this was about getting Dr. Tam to explain some of the thinking behind that advice. But ultimately, it's the government's behavior that must be examined, must be held to account, which is happening now and which will happen more going forward as we learn more. All right. Well, very insightful interview. Rosie, thanks so much. Thanks, Andrew.